This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Tuesday afternoon, August the 29th in the year 2006. It's just gone uh, 12 o'clock here, and uh, Mr. Mernan and myself are sitting here in large meeting room B at the Niles Public Library uh, in Niles, Illinois. Um, we are very appreciative that Mr. Mernan has agreed uh, to be interviewed for this project, and uh, here is his story. So, uh, Mr. Mernan, you were born in, on October the 9th, 1926. Right, in Chicago, Illinois. In Chicago, Illinois. So you were uh, a young man at the time of the oh, what, outbreak of World War II. Yeah. yeah. So how did you come to enter the, the service at that time? This is probably the easiest question in the world to answer. I was drafted. You were drafted? Yes, right. I was in high school, and at that time, the laws permitted kids who were in their senior year in high school. I went to St. Rita High School in Chicago. Uh, they, the law permitted you to finish your high school year, but as soon as you graduated, you were immediately drafted, and that's what happened to me. I graduated from high school. They call it the drafty class in uh, December of uh, 44, yeah, okay. And then I was drafted in January 45. I was in, at Fort Sheridan about, what, 15 days after I graduated high school. Yeah, so, um St. Rita, they were known as the Mustangs? Was yeah, oh, right? what a murmur. You are a Southsider. <laughs> and um, it's interesting is that you graduated at mid-year. Did you? You didn't wait until, it wasn't a June graduation, it was a December yeah, graduation. Yeah, they did that so that they could get us graduated before we went into the service. So I guess they figured out, uh, let's get them graduated because if they get killed overseas, then at least we'll have that information. See, we, all of us who graduated or went into the service at that point, trained for the invasion of Japan. And that's what I trained for as an infantryman uh, initially. So you knew the draft was coming for oh, you? Yeah. And, and you figured it was going to be the Army? You didn't have a preference for the Navy or Coast Guard Well, I had or something? a preference, sure. What was your I preference? would like to be in the Navy because that's hot water and clean and all that stuff. But, you know, I went up to uh, an officer, much like yourself, and looked at my paper, and what, where they stamp and boom, infantry. Yeah, so I trained for the invasion of Japan. Was that training. down at was that induction center in downtown Chicago yes. somewhere? Yes, induction center in Chicago, and then I was sent to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, for initial processing, and then from that point I was shipped to Camp Fannin, F-A-N-N-I-N, Texas, in East Texas, uh, for initial infantry training. From there, I can go on with my stops if you want. For Camp Fannin, I finished 17 weeks of uh, infantry training, uh, was sent home for a follow, sent back to Texas Camp Maxi, M-A-X-I-E, in, uh, still in East Texas, that was training for uh, invasion of Japan, infantry training. Then from there, I was sent to uh, a, a camp in Oregon. I'm not quite sure the, of the name of that one, but more infantry training. Finally, I was sent to a camp in uh, Washington State. Uh, from there, we more, more training, and from that point, we went overseas from camp. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name Was of that a, the camp. You, That's you, a long time ago. Yeah, so you, you had your boot camp in, in uh, down in Camp Fannin, was it? Yeah, that? a boot camp in two Texas camps, Camp Fannin and Camp Maxi, Texas. Was that a pleasant experience or unpleasant or it was what it was? And well, it was an adventure. It was a, a pleasant. I was in good health. I was 19 years old. And you got to remember that World War II was a very popular war. And if I didn't get into the service, I would have been crushed. 
So you and all your friends, you were looking forward to going oh, in yeah, and absolutely. doing your part. Absolutely. Patriotic. Sure. No question. Well, yeah, because, again, we were attacked, and everybody felt that way. If so much so, to see if we didn't get in the Army, you were called a draft dodger, and it was a very ne negative type of thing. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. So was that the first time you had done a lot of traveling in the United States? Yep. So you must have met all different kinds of people oh, and seen yeah. all different kinds of places? Oh, uh, sure. Well, you know, as kids, uh, I wouldn't have the opportunity to travel any, anywhere. Riga, this is, remember, this was just at the end of the, the, the Depression, and I was in a poor family. My father was a streetcar conductor, streetcars, and uh, so we didn't have any money, and he died early. Uh, so there was no money to go anywhere, put it that way, yeah. until the service, and all of a sudden, the world was open. And did you find it interesting to meet all these different kinds of people? Fascinating. And you got on well, pretty well with all of them? I'm sorry? You, you got on very well with, with most of the people? Oh, yeah. Here? See, uh, uh, during high school years, I fell in love with the Spanish language. Uh, I found that I had an ear for that, so I developed a pretty good uh, language ability, and so when I was in the Philippines, the alternate language to English and Tagalog, the native language, was Spanish because of the Spanish education system uh, prior to uh, the Spanish-American War. So I got along well because I spoke the language. So you were trained in the uh, in the infantry yep. as part of the, but then you wound up in the, um, they, you were assigned to the Army Air Corps? Uh, yeah, did you remember, as I was on the ship going over to the Philippines, a, v, a VJ that we, the uh, atom bomb or dropped, a, a, a VJ occurred and World War II was over. So by the time I stepped off the ship in, uh, in the Philippines, and First on Leyte Island, L-A-Y-T-E, and then Luzon Island, L-U-Z-O-N, uh, the war was over. So were you actually on the ship when they dropped the bomb? Oh, yeah. So how did you feel about them dropping the bomb? Well, once we, didn't, we didn't hear about it until we got uh, to Leyte, and we were ecstatic for one reason only, we would live. Because the the odds predicted for the invasion of Japan were at least one million casualties, so that was insurance we, that we were going to live for through World War Two. Wow, fascinating experience. Oddly enough, I sort of figured you'd ask me how it was. The first thing I remember in getting off the ship, not in Leyte because we didn't get off the boat there, but in Lausanne where I was stationed, this is the big island where Milanola is, the first thing I noticed was the smell. Not an unpleasant smell, a greenhouse smell, a fetid, growing, green, humid type of thing. i never forget that. I don't forget it now. Wow. Yeah. And from there, and then everything was a fascinating experience because I was open, I loved geography, I've been history, and I knew I would live. So you, 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 set, you sailed from the United States on a, on a ship? Yeah, I, I sailed probably on from yeah, the US, USS Bolivar, B O L I V R R, APA 34. APA means uh, an armed naval transport. And I sailed from uh, Vancouver, Washington, to Leyte, L-A-Y-T, in the southern Philippines. From there, new orders were received, and the ship took us to Luzon, L-U-Z-O-N, Luzon, uh, in the northern Philippines. This is the big island where uh, the uh, capital of Manila is located. And when you got on the ship, you thought you were going to be in the infantry invading Japan. And when you, when you get to the Philippines, you're no longer going to invade Japan. And then the, is that when the decision is made to put you in the Army Air Corps? I guess so. You never know. I, yeah. The first the thing that we put me in, because I was a drummer uh, in uh, St. Rita Band, 
they put me in an Air Corps band. That, that didn't work out, so they sent me some, or all of a sudden, finally, sent me up to Clark, C-L-A-R-K, field in the northern Philippines, which was the big air base for the 13th Air Corps. That was the Air Corps. See, various Army Air Corps were divided during World War II. At 5th was in Europe, and at the 13th was in the Philippines, Sayapan, Tinian, the Western Marianas Islands. During this time, how did you find the, the army food or the food in the Philippines? Did you interested in it at uh, all? Well, did you gain weight? Did you lose weight? Yeah, did okay. You... Uh, did I lose weight? Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't even conscious of weight. How did like like the army food? Remember, I was in the army for almost nine months at that point. I was used to it. It wasn't a question of liking. It was a question of getting enough. Getting yeah, enough of it. Sure. Uh, that was okay. It kept you alive. But I, you know, I'm not a big food person, and I wasn't then, so probably this is just as well. Yeah. The um, so you were spent most of your time in Philippines then at Clark Air Force Base. Uh, yes, most of my time at Clark Air Force Base and. Clark, of course, was on the island of Luzon, L U Z U E O N. And so, so I split my time between Clark Field and Manila. I get to know Manila very well. I still do. So, what what were your duties then while you were at Clark? Then, at Clark Field, I was a supply sergeant. I was a corporal. But they called me sergeant. I literally passed out supplies, uniforms, underwear, that type of thing. And also, I was able to develop a friendship with the sergeant in charge of the motor pool. Very good liaison to make because then he came into the supply depot for white t-shirts, which were very, very and much in demand. He could borrow firearm, that type of thing. In return, he would let me borrow jeeps and multiple stuff so I could go all over the, let's say, a, a mutual advantage society. We helped each other. And was it, uh, was it hard work at that time? Nah, nothing. The war was over and it was difficult to stay busy. There was nothing to do. We were just waiting to go home. And very unbusy, sitting. Did you have a lot of time to write letters home to people, or did you do that, or how did you have to stay uh, in touch? Yeah, a lot of uh, time uh, to write letters home, a lot of time to go into the local towns, like drunk, drunk, all that type of stuff. Uh, a lot of recreational time, put it that way. Did you play like baseball or uh, football or? Yeah, baseball. I think I wasn't much for sports. But I was very much for borrowing jeeps from the water driving around and all uh, geography all over the northern um, area because I loved the, the geography. I got maps, that type of thing. So I can, became very interested in the local geography, flora, flora fauna, the whole nine years. I still remember, and I also picked up some Filipino language. Must be a beautiful country. Yes, I thought so. Yeah. And oddly enough, what I'm doing now ties into that after all these years because I worked in a lot of local hospital with uh, a lot of Filipino nurses. Oh, yes. And I still remember some of the language, and a lot of the nurses are from the area that I was in the Philippines. So we had a great time reminiscing. Yeah. I liberated their pieces of their parents most of the time. Yeah. Clark Air Force Base, is that still there, or did the United States close that down, or? I'm not sure. I heard that it was being closed down as far as a military base was concerned, but kept open as a, a terminus for UPS air and that type of thing. I'm not quite sure at that point, though. I heard that from some of the Filipino people that I worked with, and I wouldn't be surprised because a huge basin of a lot of runways and that type of thing. Yeah. So the, um, the, Ameri think. the American soldiers must have been fairly, were they fairly popular among the Philippine, Filipino people, right? Heroes. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we liberated them from the Japanese, and every, anybody who wore a, an American uniform was a hero, and that lasted all through my time in the Philippines, and of course, lasted when I came home. It was not at all like the Vietnam experience. They wore the same uniform that I wore. I came home over here, a Vietnam person came home, a bomb, and I was spit on. Did you mention that you uh, did have to spend some time in the hospital when you were in the Philippines? Yes. Uh, when I was a patient at Clark Field, probably sometime in early 1946, I'm, I'm guessing there, uh, I contracted tropical encephalitis, which is a tropic of sleeping sickness. It can be very fatal. Two or three, four people in my base got it. They died. I lived. I was in. Clark Base Hospital for, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks, something like that. But uh, then I was sent up to the mountain capital of the Philippines, Baguio, B-A-G-I-O, which was a, a cool area and a recuperation center. So I was there, I guess, for about, Let's say two or three weeks, but I'm not sure. The, the memory gets a little hazy yeah. at that, was that point. Did you, you contract that disease from a, a germ or an insect? or uh, An insect. Insect. Yeah. And were you worried at that time about your... No, because I was asleep. All so you time. didn't... Yeah. I went to the hospital with a big headache. Uh, I fell over, and I woke up three weeks later in the hospital with them shooting me what I guess was a penicillin at that point. But say that I lived. So you were you were maybe sleeping for a couple of weeks then. Oh yeah, I have no idea. Wow. And they see they didn't show you medical records in those days at all. But they told me what happened to me and said that I was okay, assured that we're going to send me up to a recuperation center, which is cool, you know, rather than the lowlands, which is uh, to track a pickle. So that's what happened. But I had no idea what had happened to me until I woke up and they told me, you know, sort, sort of a post-trauma type of thing. Yeah. So you were able to return to your regular uh, duties there? After a while, yeah. They sent me back to the supply department at the 13th Corps, and I stood there, and I think for six more and some more, something like that, until I went back to Millet, Millet for discharge and returned to the United States. This is probably now we're talking about Virtually the end in 1946. I have the exact date somewhere, but my memory says this. Sure. Um, when you came back, um, did you find it difficult to, to move back into civilian life? Did you have to look for a career? Did you ever think of making a career of the Army or anything oh, like that? Oh, hell no. <laughs> they, no, they wanted. Uh, us all to re-up the, called the RE hyphen UP, uh, re-enlist, but forget it, two years was enough. Uh, but during the uh, war, uh, I'm sorry, during my hospital experience, I came to know a chaplain, a father carpenter, uh, who got me interested in the old GI Bill of Education at that point and told me that I could have four years of university for nothing. So I couldn't pass that up. And when I got home, I looked into that and uh, enlisted, uh, I searched to say, enrolled at Northwestern University, and then first went to two years of junior college. That's how they did that, that then. Then from there, I switched to Northwestern in Chicago in Evanston and graduated from Northwestern. So where did you where did you go to your two years uh, community or junior college? Oh, just general stuff. Where did you attend? Where? Oh, where? Crane or uh... no? It was on the south side. It was the old Lindblom High School, but I they think them at Frick can remember the name of the thing. Call it Lindblom Junior College, but then I switched from there. When I finished the two years uh, and switched to Northwestern, was enrolled there and graduated with graduated Northwestern with the class of 1950. 
And what was what was your major in uh, marketing and advertising? Marketing and advertising. And then did you go into marketing and advertising? Yes, uh, I have been through. Uh, have some good contacts, and I got my first job through those contacts actually as an advertising space salesman with a magazine that was for commercial florists. So that was the cure for the next 40 years. So you didn't, um, you didn't have any trouble then readjusting to life and then you, when you came home, did you live at home? Did you find it hard to I be at home? I lived at home. No? Yeah, no problem because all of my friends were home at that time and we were all overseas. So we had a great deal in common. Of course, yeah. uh, some of them were from the Pacific, some were from Europe, but we had that great deal of commonality. So there was really no, no readjustment trauma at all. Did you uh, did you reside on campus? Did you no, no, your last two years? Home. You still commuted the, the, your, oh, la sure. your two years at Northwestern. Yeah, in the meantime, I bought an old clunk Ford car so I could communicate. But yeah, yeah. Did so, you um, did you make any friends in the in the service that you've maintained over the years or kept up with or? Uh, initially, yes. I they were one or two from the south side. I vaguely remember the names, but I don't remember enough about them. But you know, you split up. You say you're going to keep sure. in contact. Of well, hell, you go your own ways. So you uh, if you throw it back into for your knife, and that goes the way I want mine, and that was it. Yeah, I never kept up with any of it then. I don't know. How do you think um, serving in the military affected your life? probably the most single, most formative factor that ever happened to my human development. Wow. Because it took me as a rather naive kid from the south side who <clears throat> was no further than downtown Chicago, and all of a sudden I was in the Philippine Islands half a world away with a completely different experience, job, language, etc. And for me, that was the type of thing that I ate up. I still do. Geography, history, languages, people, that type of thing. And of course, once the war was over and there was no I'm, danger of my getting killed, that put a whole new pro uh, perspective on the thing. Yeah. So I just enjoyed every minute of that. Ad. I almost re-enlisted because they told me, well, I, we make you a sergeant and you pay you, what, $50 a month if you re-enlist. I almost did, not for the money, but for, I loved the Philippines. I liked, I wanted us to save it, but now I had to choose between the Philippines and going back uh, home and going to college, so I chose that. So you're, everybody at home was glad to see you. Oh, yeah. They must have been worried when they heard about the the sleeping sickness. My mother was very yeah. definitely, she still, uh, she's dead now, but she still saved the, the telegram. I think my sister, you know, no required her that I I was, uh, then my mother got the telegram, there was a, a lady on the block on the south side that was an army nurse, and my mother took the telegram over to her, and uh, pardon me, this a lady was able to tell my mother what this is all about, so reassures her some, uh, somewhat. And then uh, another telegram, telegram came about maybe a month later, reassuring her that I was okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Communications wasn't as there are now. Oh, today it's we almost too much communication. Yeah, we don't have an internet. I, we didn't have an internet no, then. We didn't no. have any have a computer. Yeah. So then, um, so your interest in people and new things and ideas, that sort of was expressed by your choosing to major in um, advertising and... Yes. But Actually, you, you, didn't I, think, you didn't think of going into history or geography or the social studies? No, because the, you, you had to think for, for good money, too. I, knew, I needed to get out of the service and make a buck. And, uh, Advertising and marketing could give me an income. History and geography, I taught school, and uh -uh. at that time, I couldn't make it. 
Yeah. Financially. So you you pursue your interest in history and geography through your reading and oh yeah, uh, uh -huh. sure. And of course, events. years down, the uh, the Pike I developed I quite a history, uh, more of an quite a history interest in the Civil War, and from there on in, you know, I just get deeper and deeper into that languages and so on. What should I is my major interest now. Um. We're coming to the closing of the That's interview. That's okay. Um, did your military, this is kind of a standard question, it's a good one. Um, do you think your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes. In, in what way, perhaps? I'm putting this together. I expected this question, but Let's put it this way. Uh, I ab absolutely supported our effort in World War II. We were attacked as a uh, popular war. Okay. The next war to come around was Korea. Same thing. Uh, it was a relatively popular war, but I still supported it. Then came Vietnam. And the, I was on the side, first of all, that did not support the Vietnam War. However, I supported all the guys who were in it because they wore the same uniform as they did. I said this earlier. But I came home a hero. They came home a bum. They got spit on. They applauded me. So I always resented not the Vietnam War. I resented the attitude of the government and the people in this country towards those soldiers as contrast to the soldiers who were in World War II. And so, let's say, I, I, I'm uh, intensely patriotic and uh, intensely, not intensely pro-military, I'm intensely proactive uh, insofar as being patriotic is concerned. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I support every war I think we get into. The current wars that we're in, in Iraq is insane, but that's another question and another time. Thank you. This, this is basically, a, I'm pro-government, pro-philosophy pro of government, but not necessarily pro-military. You have to take that apart. Thank you for your uh, thoughtful conclusion. Huh? Thank you for your thoughtful conclusion. Thank you. Yeah, I think that explains things a bit. Um, well, is there anything else that you, anything you'd like to add to the interview that we haven't covered? Um, Not really. Well, the, one thing. It's just we, okay. You have the picture here of my coming home. USAT Ainsworth, which is a military transfer. All of us were on the ship. We pulled into. Uh, near Seattle, Washington, a Vancouver Island, Washington, huge sign on there. I never forget that one, that this one, huge sign lit up uh, with spotlights, welcome home, job well done. And we cried. Wow. The only time I ever, ever remember crying is a dub dub. We sobbed because all of a sudden, all the emotion, the yearning, the fear, the thing, just exploded and we were able to we were able to cry actually and I think that was an expression of our deep love for our country and I've always felt that way I do now I I'm proud of my military service I'm glad I had the opportunity to serve it was like a couple of years no big deal my story is not unique in any way don't pretend that to be that way but I'm proud that I could serve and a bird review. Thank you, Mr. Renan.